Welcome to the second day of, of Yufna Dimensions. I hope everybody is, is doing well. Um, before we start with the session, just a quick update on today's schedule. So we have the two talks now in the morning, and then we have um, a discussion session at 11. So, you know, we thought, you know, there's so many amazing people here doing interesting stuff. Yesterday you had a chance to see all the posts. There's already quite a lot of talks, you know. So, um, you know, take over the terrace, go around and, 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 and enjoy the discussions. And then um, we'll have a session in the afternoon. You will have seen that on the schedule then at, I think, 4 or 4.30 or something like this, there's another talk that we wanted to advertise a little bit. It's about how to do math in, in 2030 and how math, you know, with transformers will, you know, how we will all get out of jobs, basically. And since you, if you want to know about that, feel free to join that talk. And then we'll meet again for a little hike, which will be really just a walk through the castle down uh, the seaside. And then we'll have a little aperitivo, OK? Um, we'll tell you later exactly when we meet and where. Uh, but yeah, this is kind of the, the plan for today. And OK, we'll start with the first, with the first session. And our first speaker will be Reza Gesari, who's uh, an assistant professor at Northwestern. And he's going to continue our sort of stream at this conference on, on the dynamics of learning and the dynamics of SGD. So yeah, thank you for coming and looking forward to your talk. Okay. Thank you very much for um, the invitation to be here. It's a beautiful setting, very nice to be here. Um, and thanks for coming to the talk. So I want to talk about some uh, work from last year with Gerard Benarus, who's at NYU, and Akash Draganath, who's at Waterloo, on high dimensional limits for stochastic gradient descent. Um, yeah, so let me just uh, give a quick, like, set up the notation and framework for everyone. So block these chats. Um, So the general statistical framework we're thinking about is, you know, common one. We have some IID data stream that's coming in. Um, that's these Y sub I's, and there's M data points, capital M, and they're all coming from some common distribution, P sub Y. And we have some loss function that's L for me, and there's a parameter space R to the P and an input space R to the D. So P and D will be the dimension of the parameter space and the um, input data space. And there's some risk function uh, corresponding to this loss function. So we take the empirical average across the data set of the loss function. And um, so this is a common framework. It captures lots of problems that we've all seen before, like the parameter estimation tasks, classification tasks, neural networks, things like that. Um, you can put into this language. and the common goal is to minimize this empirical risk. Um, and hopefully that gives you some good, you know, the, the parameter that minimizes that gives you some good solution to the task at hand. So some typical features of this uh, framework are that, you know, as m goes to infinity, as long as there's some reasonable moments, then you have a law of large numbers for the risk function. So it'll converge to this phi that will be recurring throughout the talk. So that's the population risk or the population loss for me. It's just the expectation of the loss function at the value and parameter space that you're considering. And so here's you know, a simple picture of the risk on the left and the population loss on the right. And you see, OK, so it's common for the population loss itself to be simpler in some sense than the noisy version, um, the risk than the risk. But on the other hand, symmetries of the problem often lead to even non-convexity for the population loss. So I'm really thinking about uh, non-convex problems throughout this talk, uh, and so SGD and non-convex settings. Um, then the global minimizer or global minimizers of this phi will be good solutions to the classification or estimation task that you're considering. So otherwise, it's not a good loss function, essentially. And so, OK. so. This leads to maybe the empirical risk R is hard to optimize because it's you know has lots of local minima, saddle points, things like that. Gradient descent doesn't do so well. So people use things like stochastic gradient descent, which isn't optimizing so much on that, but is some stochastic approximation to the phi and optimizes there. Um, OK, so I'm, I think most of us are familiar with this kind of thing. 
So stochastic gradient descent is um, the following algorithm. And I'm thinking throughout this talk only about the online one pass setting. Um, so we have this uh, m set of m data points. And I move around in my parameter space by iteratively making a gradient update according to the loss L evaluated at my current parameter point on the next data point. So the, the point is that the next data point that I'm getting is independent of where I've moved to up to this point. Um, and little delta will be the step size for me. OK, so the reason this works reasonably is that these are, you know, each of these incremental updates are stochastic approximations to the gradient of the population loss in the sense that if I break up this grad L term, I can split it into the grad phi, which is the mean part, plus a noise term. The mean part will be like what I'll call the population drift. It's a gradient update on the population loss, which just really depends. Um, there's no randomness there. It just depends on your point in parameter space. And then the, the random part, the second term, is a martingale increment. So you expect it to average out as the step size gets small, um, and you'd make many updates. Okay, And so in this way, you're really doing some kind of optimization scheme on this smoothed out population loss landscape. Yeah. Yeah, so the grad phi should not have the yk in it. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. That was, that was, that's the point, yes. <laughs> Um, all right. So the theory of uh, you know stochastic approximations goes back to the work of Robbins and Monroe in the 1950s, and they showed that kind of as you'd expect from the previous slide, if you look at the trajectory of the stochastic gradient descent in the parameter space, you take the step size to zero, then it converges to the solution of the ODE, which is the gradient flow on the population loss. OK, so the martingale increments indeed average out, and you can get this kind of a law of large numbers for the trajectory of the dynamics. Um, since then, I mean, this is a long time ago, lots of other work has studied um, stochastic gradient descent in what I'm calling fixed dimensions, in the sense that the dimension of the parameter space is fixed, the task is fixed, the, uh, the data space is fixed, everything's fixed, and you're just taking the step size to zero. And in that limit, so you get this law of large numbers. You can also get a central limit theorem for the trajectory, or like an invariance principle, large deviation principles, um, all kinds of very precise information for how the SGD trajectory approximates the gradient flow. Um, but the one thing I really want to emphasize about this whole story is that this is all for a fixed problem, fixed parameter space, uh, fixed dimension, et cetera, and only the step size is changing. Um, that's, that's the limits that we're taking. So the goal of this talk is to look at like, the high dimensional um, setting for stochastic gradient descent and obtain some kind of limit theorems uh, in appropriate ways. Um, OK, so any questions about this just background? So in modern data statistics, where data science, statistics, et cetera, we're often data constrained, so we need to think about high dimensional settings. Um, and by that, we mean, you know, if I'm taking delta to zero, the step size to zero, that corresponds to taking my number of samples to infinity. But taking my number of samples to infinity relative to the dimension of the parameter space is often imp impossible. You know, that's not the regime that we're often in. And so analytically, the common approach to studying, you know, this kind of more data constraint setting is to take the the different uh, things to scale together. So the dimension of the problem to scale with the number of samples that you have access to. And so in particular, what I'm going to be thinking of is we have some family of statistical tasks now. There, you know, In some sense, there's some consistency that we're assuming on them. But you have a family of tasks all indexed by n. They each have their um, input spaces, their parameter spaces, p sub n and d sub n being their dimensions. And you have step sizes corresponding to these little delta sub ends. And so for instance, just uh, you know, one thing you can think of is what I'll call the proportional asymptotic regime, where you know, the dimension of the problem's n, the step size is 1 over n. So the number of samples is proportional to the dimension of the parameter space. So this is a kind of common assumption, I think, um, 
in like high dimensional settings. So a couple of simple examples to have in mind that will recur are, you know, you can imagine you get uh, rank K matrices and by N matrices that are corrupted by some Gaussian noise. So here the parameter space says N for the, or N times K maybe for the different uh, vectors that are the planted ones. And then the dimension of the input data is N squared for the matrices you're getting. And then you take, um, you imagine that the number of samples you have access to is proportional to N. Um, another one is classification of a, some mixture of K Gaussians with some arbitrary labeling on them. And uh, similarly, you have this kind of proportional uh, access to a proportional number of uh, data points to the dimension of the parameter space. Okay. So when we have this kind of uh, diverging family of tasks indexed by something like N, we obviously can't look at the trajectory of the full stochastic gradient descent. You know, it's on living on different spaces as I change N. So we need to project down onto some finite dimensional observables or what I'll call summary statistics in order to get meaningful limits um, in, any, in any reasonable sense. And so what I'm going to call summary statistics will be these, this uh, finite dimensional family of observables that we're going to track. And so these will be what we want to prove limit theorems about. And so let, you know, we imagine that there's some K uh, summary statistics that we want to track. And the important thing here is that K is going to be independent of N. Okay, so K is going to be fixed, and I take my N to infinity and get some limit theorems. Okay, so in this level of generality, there's uh, many, you know, many people in this audience have worked on these kinds of questions. I'm not saying anything. Uh, revolutionary, and um, there's a few approaches, I guess, to studying stochastic gradient descent in uh, non-convex settings specifically that have kind of made significant progress in recent years. So I just want to outline a few of these to then talk about where our work fits into them. So one of these approaches, which I think uh, a lot of people here have worked on, is um, what I'll call, I guess, getting some kind of ordinary differential equation limits as long as you start away from critical points of this, uh, of this population landscape. So in the same way that we got convergence to gradient flow for the, um, in the finite dimensional setting, if you look at some uh, family of summary statistics that are the relevant ones, um, you can take limits in, the, in this high dimensional setting that I talked about. And in fact, uh, here a lot of, uh, the work that I've cited here includes you know, looking not just at online one pass gradient descent, but also considering like Langevin type dynamics or gradient flow type dynamics where there's more memory and it's harder to understand. And you can get some kind of ODEs or coupled systems of ODEs as the limits of these observables. And, um, and then you can try and analyze those ODEs that you get either numerically or analytically. Um, so progress has been made on you know, several questions in this way. Um, one thing I want to emphasize, though, is, you know, the, the population landscape that I drew, it had something, or if you imagine even, like, a rank one matrix corrupted by noise, so like a spiked matrix model, oftentimes there's some inherent symmetries to the problem. So maybe, like, in the one observable, you have some landscape like this um, due to some inherent symmetry. And the important thing is, like, you have to start kind of macroscopically away from the saddle point or from the critical points in order for the ODEs that you get to actually do anything on the time scales that you get limits. So, you know, if I, if I get some limiting trajectory that's, you know, gradient flow on this landscape for my correlation with some planted vector, if I start any, with any initializations that are converging to this saddle point, they're not going to move in the limit. Um, that I'm ending up with. So that's why I write that this is, in, in some sense, there's some warm starts. And so the common approach here is you get some, uh, you take uh, limits, you understand what the behavior of these trajectories do if you start like macroscopically away from the saddle point, and then you send that macroscopic amount to zero to try and like read off some uh, behavior near the saddle point. Okay. Um, a different approach that's kind of been, uh, made successful in a few more problem-specific examples, I guess, in more restrictive settings, is uh, 
specific problems where you can actually take uh, limits or at least get some kind of upper bounds or lower bounds on the behavior if you take even initializations that are converging to the saddle points. So in, uh, in a lot of these problems, like uh, phase retrieval, for instance, you do have some kind of uh, basic symmetry like this. And a random initialization in your high dimensional space is going to lead to a sequence of initial points in the projected space that's converging to this saddle point. Um, so for these, uh, for a few specific problems, there's been some progress in understanding like, OK, what's the actual time complexity of escaping this flatness near the saddle? And then after that, you can apply the kind of uh, you know, warm start understanding from, the, from approach one. Um, a third direction, which is a little separate from one and two, is uh, problems where there's not so much these uh, finite dimensional set of observables that are the relevant statistics. Um, there's been some progress in taking like empirical measures. This is sometimes called like a mean field approach or infinite width limits, kernel methods. So you can look at like an empirical measure in the parameter space and get partial differential equations instead of ordinary differential equations for the limit of those. And then these become maybe, I mean, pretty intractable, but maybe you can do something with them um, and understand this and pull back some information about the actual SGD from this approach. OK, so this is a kind of different uh, approach. So my goal in the talk and the goal of this result was in some sense to unify approaches one and two um, to allow for consideration of, you know, you have some finite dimensional set of statistics that are the relevant ones. You maybe end up with some ODEs as the limits um, when you take some limits, but maybe you should allow your initializations to vary and you want to blow up around the saddle points at the same time and understand uh, what's the behavior locally near the saddle points. And so there, instead of getting ordinary differential equations, maybe there's some residual stochasticity because this is a very flat landscape. So there's no strong drift. So the, the stochastic part of the stochastic gradient descent should persist in the limit also. And so the general uh, gist of the result is that uh, you can take sequences of initializations that are you know, converging to saddle points and get stochastic differential equation limits, or ones that are not converging to saddle points and get ordinary differential equation limits um, for a Class of fam for a class of problems where there's some finite number of statistics that capture most of what you care about in the problem. All right. Any questions? Okay. So um, let me say, uh, I think, a little more precisely what our setup is and what we're assuming about the problem. So I apologize for this uh, kind of ugly slide with assumptions. I'll try and just give you a gist of what the assumptions are. So first of all, we have, some, we have some family of summary statistics. That's the, you know, the observables that we're interested in tracking in this n to infinity limit. And um, what I'm going to assume on the problem in terms of regularity is uh, you know, threefold. The first one is that the summary statistics aren't uh, too spiky. They're, you know, they're Hessian is has some reasonably bounded operator norm. So I'll remind you that you can imagine delta n is approximately 1 over n, or it's 1 over the number of samples is the proportionality you should think about. So we are allowing some of the norms of like the Hessian of the observables to blow up with the dimension. It doesn't have to be uni uniformly Lipschitz, but there's some regularity assumptions on them. Um, so that's item one. Item two is a matter of the regularity of the lost landscape. So here, again, the thing I want to emphasize is we're assuming that the population loss is uniformly Lipschitz, but not that the loss itself is uniformly Lipschitz. Okay, so the, the loss landscape itself can blow up, uh, its Lipschitz norm can blow up with the dimension of the problem, which is the kind of, this is the kind of uh, scaling you'd encounter. And I mean, I'll give you examples, but for instance, the the spiked matrix or the mixture of Gaussians or a spike tensor, all of these fall into this uh, class. So those are kinds of, so those are situations where the loss is more spiky than the population loss, and uh, that's why. And the third one is basically that the noise, so this is L minus phi is the noise in the loss, once you recenter out the mean, isn't correlated with any of your summary statistics like too much. 
So the idea is all of the information in the problem or most of the information in the problem should be captured by the population part, not by the noise part, which, I mean, the noise should be fairly uninformative. Um, OK, so one thing is, uh, yeah, these kinds of assumptions on the loss landscape is we're not assuming that it's uniformly Lipschitz, but it's, uh, this is the kind of scaling that you'd get if it were like random vectors in d-dimensional space, like random Gaussians, for instance, is that, that kind of scaling. And uh, that's what leads right to this. OK, so here's some examples of, yes. So, OK, so this is infinity uniformly over compact, not everywhere in space. Um, in theory, you'd want, to, you'd want to allow, like, maybe there's some atypical parts of the world where, you know, it has bad norm, and, but your SGD avoids them. But we, yeah, we weren't able to, you know, decouple the trajectory from the, like, bad parts of the Hessian in some sense. Um, yeah, so it, it can blow up as you go off to infinity in parameter spaces. This is a five pixel compact ball, then you have these kinds of bounds on your. Thing. There's some constant depending on the size of the problem. So some some examples of uh, reasonable things that we can track are uh, you know correlation with some like spiked uh, with some planted vector, for instance, or some ground truth vector. So that's like a linear statistic um, of the problem that'll always fit into this. Uh, this set of observables, something like radial components. So a lot of the times when we're thinking about a loss function, we'll have some radial penalty to confine us to you know, some compact set. And so radial penalties should always fit into this so we can track them. Um, and then other types of correlations, and especially one I want to mention is like the population loss itself. That's something that you know, if you want to say you succeeded at a problem, one way to say that is the correlation with some vector gets good, and other is that the population loss got small, so you want to include that in your family. Um, and one thing that's really important is that the, the definition I gave on the last slide has enough room that not only do all of these examples fit into it, but they fit into it even if I blow them up by like a root n factor. Um, so what I want to imagine I'm doing is I'm looking at this summary statistic. Maybe it has some landscape like this. There's some saddle point or some critical point here. And in order to get diffusive behavior near the critical point, I need to zoom in. Because at the macroscopic scale, you're really not moving around here. And so you imagine there's some central limit theorem going on. You want to blow up by an order, you know, like this is a little o, like an order 1 over square root n window. So I want to blow up by a factor of square root n to get some limiting behavior near the critical point. And the notion of like the regularity that we assume has enough room to allow you to blow up by a factor of square root n and still be a well-behaved summary statistic. Okay? So summary statistics are not only these kinds of things, but also you can recenter them around a critical point and blow them up, and they're still well-behaved enough. So then, uh, so this, this, you know, up to here, we've only assumed regularity things. You also need some consistency between your problems in order to get meaningful limits. And so that comes in the following form. So we basically, uh, we assume that the gradient flow on the loss when it acts on these observables. So that, that first thing you see on the top left is the gradient of the population loss uh, grad of the observables that admits some meaningful limit along with a second order kind of term that I'll describe in a second. If these admit some limits as n goes to infinity, so they're, on, they're approximately only functions of the summary statistics themselves, then you have the consistency criterion that you need. So the first thing is like a drift for the summary statistics. That's what this h will be. And the second one is a diffusivity for the summary statistics, OK? Um, one thing is, if you, you have freedom to take your step size arbitrarily small. Um, if you take your step size very small, then both of the, you know, the orange and the green term both drop out. And then it's just gradient flow for the population loss. So you recover the only a, a like finite dimensional kind of uh, behavior. That'll become clear. Um, and then if your step size isn't too small, then you can have these kinds of second order operators that are relevant also. So 
you might wonder, like, okay, this seems uh, fairly restrictive. Um, or how do I come up with what uh, the family of observables such that this closes? So yeah, some problems might not have, a, you know, if I took a rank n to the epsilon matrix and corrupted it by Gaussian noise, that does not fit in our framework. That's why we need like a finite dimensional set of uh, observables that you can track. But to get that finite dimensional set of observables, you can start with like the population loss and then just try and close this. So take the gradient, see what other observables you need to add in in order to close this, and that'll give you your set of summary statistics that you want to track for the problem. And so under these two assumptions, uh, then the main result is that if I take the trajectories of the stochastic gradient descent projected by these observables, and I take the n goes to infinity limits, then they converge to the solutions of the stochastic differential equation, whose drift is the limit of the drift term, the first term, and whose volatility matrix is the limit of the second term. So that's the volatility. All right. So it could be that sigma is 0, and this will be an ODE, in particular when delta is going to 0 fast enough, so you have access to enough samples, then you shouldn't expect any like volatility in them. You should just expect the finite dimensional ODE limits. And that's what's going to happen. So you, know, you take delta going to 0 fast enough, the, the orange and the green term drop out. This is just gradient flow on the population loss. But it could also be that there's some residual stochasticity, which will happen, for instance, near saddles. And then you'll have this space-dependent volatility matrix sigma. OK? Um, all right, so let me give a kind of general remark of how this relates to this kind of picture that I was giving here. When we see ODE limits, when we see SDE limits, and then I'll give a few examples um, of how you, this can be applied to study certain problems. Any questions about the statement of the result? So a few, yeah, maybe one comment or a couple comments I want to make are, one of them is H here does not have to be a gradient flow. So it doesn't have to be that there's some like loss landscape for the finite dimensional observables on which you're doing a gradient flow. This second order correction term can really make it a non-gradient ODE. And this, the volatility matrix, I mean, sometimes it's common to assume lower bounds on the diffusivity of your, or lower bounds on the variance of your stochastic increments, things like this. Uh, we don't make any such assumptions. And so in particular, the volatility can be highly degenerate certain places. So you can lead to degenerate diffusions and uh, things that would actually like keep you stuck at saddle points because there's not enough volatility to let you escape, um, things like that. So the sigma can be rank deficient. It can be uh, degenerate in that sense. So when you look at this, when you take uh, the kinds of summary statistics I was saying before for a generic problem that fits into the framework, oftentimes what's going to happen is that um, because of the scaling relations, the first limit you get for the summary statistics is just an ordinary differential equation. So the volatility part goes to 0 in the limit. And you're left with just the solution to the ODE, dut is h uh, dt. And now if you stare at this one, h was the limit of these two operators. If your step size is going to 0 fast enough, it's just gradient flow for the population loss and you recover the finite dimensional picture. But there's exactly a critical scaling of delta. So there's, for any family of summary statistics, there's going to be one scaling of delta at which that middle term doesn't vanish. And at that scaling, there's a second order correction, which is coming from the high dimensionality of the problem. So this was observed by Saad and Sola and a while ago, actually, in a in like teacher-student setups that there's this kind of second-order Ito correction that persists in the high-dimensional limit. And so we're finding this in a, this general class of problems, I guess. Um, and so you have this potential second-order operator that's changing the landscape um, in this high-dimensional setting. Now, this gives you some, some dynamical system for your set of summary statistics. It'll have, you know, it's going to be potentially non-convex, or oftentimes it'll have many fixed points, some of which are unstable, some are stable. And now suppose we want to probe the behavior near maybe an unstable fixed point, because 
a random initialization might converge to an unstable fixed point. Or like if you start somewhere, maybe you'll get to some saddle point and then you want to understand how long does it take to escape that saddle point before getting to the ground truth and actually solving the problem. So the next, uh, the next thing we can do is kind of do this zooming in around a saddle point of the landscape instead of just looking at ODEs. So suppose that your initial initializations converge to some fixed point U star of this dynamical system. What we can do is we can zoom in about the fixed point by you know, recentering my statistics, getting some new statistics U tilde, which are just the ones where I've blown up in a window around the fixed point. So you're imagining this is my fixed point where my initializations converge to, or midway through training, my SGD is converging to some saddle point. I want to understand the behavior locally near that saddle point now to understand how long it takes to leave, for instance. Let me blow up in a window around that saddle point, get some new summary statistics that are also in this well-behaved family. Now they'll admit their own you know, drift and volatility matrix. And what typically will happen is that these rescaled ones now don't have their volatility going to zero. They have some persistent stochasticity. Okay? And so this will now satisfy a stochastic differential equation limit, which is this one. You know, it's some, it has some new drift function and it has some new volatility matrix. Okay. So this is a kind of heuristic picture of what we're doing. So let me give a few examples of um, how this works for the, you know, the matrix, spiked matrix type of uh, problem that I mentioned as an example in a mixture of Gaussians type of problem. Okay. So here's example one is denoising a rank one matrix, let's say. A very simple problem. I have some uh, planted vector V. And we're given IID um, samples of lambda VV transpose plus some Gaussian noise. So it's just corrupted by Gaussian noise. And we just take uh, you know, the log likelihood, so this L2 loss function, which is just y minus xx transpose um, uh, norm squared. And the summary statistics for this problem, it's pretty easy to see that the things you need to track in order to understand how this behaves uh, under the SGD are the correlation with the vector V, that's this planted vector, and the, some kind of like penalty term, the, some kind of radial uh, term. And so here I'm just tracking the orthogonal radial part. Okay, so together the two give you the full norm of the vector. Right? So obviously you have succeeded at the task if M gets close to plus or minus one. There's some inherent symmetry to the problem that other than that. Okay. So with this, if you just take the, the first kind of limit, which is the ODE limit, no zooming in, no blowing up, you just take these summary statistics, you apply our theorem, um, you end up with the following system of uh, coupled ODEs for the correlation and the orthogonal radian, uh, the, the orthogonal radius. Um, it's not too bad, but you know, it, you can pretty easily stare at it and find the fixed points. And in particular, what you find is that it has a couple fixed points when lambda is bigger than one and just one when lambda is less, less than one. So you're recovering a transition at lambda equals to one, which um, if you know, if you look at like the spectrum of the matrix, that's also where you have a, you know, something jumping out of the semicircle spectrum. Um, and if lambda is bigger than one, so the problem can actually be solved, there's an informative fixed point, which is correlation square root lambda minus one. So that means there's some, it has some positive correlation with the ground truth. And some uninformative one, which is the unstable one. That's basically in the M coordinate, you have this kind of picture. Okay? And so that's the, that's the first order limit. And if your delta is actually scaling like proportional to one over the dimension, then there's a, there is a second order correction, uh, the second order kind of term operating on the radius. That's, it's somewhere in there. Um, OK, so you can take this limit. Then you want to ask, well, you know, if I do a random initialization, my initial correlations are one over square root of the dimension. So in this limit, they're going to zero. I'm just staying put at correlation zero. I'm not leaving the, the fixed point zero one. I'm just stuck there for all time. 
So let's try and understand how long does it actually take for me to leave this, or how, what's the mechanism for actually leaving this flatness at the origin. So you zoom in around the unstable fixed point 0, 1. So what that means is I define you know, this rescaled correlation, which is I blew it up by square root of n, and a blown up uh, orthogonal uh, radius, which is blown up around its uh, fixed value. And for that, you get a system of stochastic differential equations now. These are just two ornstein uhlenbeck processes. And just uh, some interesting things are this itself has a transition at lambda equals to 1, which is where the problem goes from you know, solvable to unsolvable, where it goes from an ornstein uhlenbeck that pushes you mean reverting, so you're never going to leave this saddle point when lambda is less than 1, to an uh, ornstein uhlenbeck that's uh, mean repelling. And so that one is going to drift exponentially fast away from the saddle point when lambda is bigger than 1. And you also, something fun is that uh, the two systems actually decouple. So whereas the, the two observables were coupled in the first limit I took, when I blow up around the fixed point, you get a decoupled system of stochastic differential equations. And from this, you can read off that, like, OK, in an exact constant times log n time, I will leave this uh, flatness around the origin, and I'll get to this ODE regime and quickly zoom in this direction or that direction to the solution. Yes? So what happens to the parameters that you want? Because they either shift or decouple, and so local and that's your comparison. Yeah. Yeah, so at lambda equals to 1, I mean, this limit will give you just uh, basically just a Brownian motion at the, so this, uh, yeah, so I think that exactly at lambda equals to 1, instead of being either mean repelling or mean reverting, you'll just, uh, you'll have no drift and it'll just be stochastic. Um, and then you can do some other time rescaling. So it should be like a, it'll take longer to escape because it doesn't have this drift away from the origin. But the randomness will take you away from it eventually because it doesn't have this push towards the origin. You could take a different limit maybe to get to probe that. We didn't do that. Everything here is, yeah, correct for lambda equals to 1. It's just you, you won't read off this exponential uh, drift away from the origin because it's not there. You'd have to rescale some other way. So this is in the parameter m, the correlation parameter. Um, something like, you know, the drift is down is this way or that way if you're macroscopically away from the origin, and then locally. So this is for lambda bigger than one. I guess this is what the landscape looks like. Yeah. When lambda is less than one, it looks something like this. And so what we're doing here is zooming in around this fixed point. And I have a follow-up question about this fixed point. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Can you deduce that by doing, by choosing that matrix? Are you going, so this would be one where you can choose it. Yeah. Then are you, can you choose the ratio in here to then appreciate the ratio that you're looking for? Possibly, but we did not do this. So, I, yeah, it's a good question. I just didn't look at it. OK. In the couple minutes that remain, let me um, give a more complicated example. This was a really simple example in some sense. So. The more comp oh, and so here you just see the mean reverting and the mean repelling or in and back processes for the SGD. All right, so in the couple example uh, minutes that remain, let's take a quite a bit more complicated model. So this is a mixture of four Gaussians, but they're labeled in an XOR structure. So in the sense that these are your four means for your Gaussians, and we label the antipodal ones blue and the other direction uh, um, orange. So you have two labels for four Gaussians, a mixture of four Gaussians. Why this task? Because this is kind of a very simple task that requires a two-layer network to, um, to classify well. So there's no, it's kind of easy to see, there's no linear classifier for this problem. So you can study this on a two-layer neural network. So that's what we did. We looked at it on a two-layer ne neural network where the middle layer is a uh, fixed size. Um, and you have some, like, let's say, ReLU activation on the first one and sigmoid activation on the second. You end up with some uh, binary cross-entropy loss function. 
OK, so then you figure out what are the relevant summary statistics. And this indeed falls into the kind of class of problems that fit our theorem with some 22 summary statistics, which are like the last layer's weights, um, the correlations of the first layers with the four means that you're interested in, and then some radial terms or like orthogonal parts as inner products, things like that. And so with these, you can approximately close the problem. And therefore, you can take their limits. And what you get is, OK, an awful equation. But um, the point is you, you get some equation. You can do some stability analysis on the fixed points of this. And if you do that, you can find, for instance, like fix the middle uh, with layer to be 4, which is the smallest one, so that you can express a classifier. Then you know you, there's 39 critical regions. They have varying topological dimension in this problem. Um, you can figure out which ones of them are stable. And then you can look at things like overparameterizing this problem, so taking that middle layer width to be larger and larger, and seeing how the number of uh, critical regions changes. And for instance, ask, what's the probability under a random initialization that I'm in the ballistic uh, basin of a ground of a good classifier. So in the sense that I converge in a, with an ODE like very fast to a good solution versus what's the problem probability that I'm in the basin of a saddle point instead of one of the good classifiers. And so in this uh, problem, we studied you know, some notion of a power of overparameterization. As I take that middle layer going larger and larger, the probability that I'm in the true basin, of, that I initialize in the basin of a good classifier is going to 1 as the middle layer width goes to grows. Um, you can then also look at, you know, there were these critical regions that were saddle regions, so they're not stable, they're unstable. You can blow up around these regions, and if you do that, you get uh, diffusion, you get diffusions instead of ordinary differential equations. And something interesting you can see is these diffusions are indeed rank deficient in the sense that I mentioned earlier. So they, they're really degenerate diffusions. They move only in certain coordinates rather than all of them. And so they can get stuck for arbitrarily long times in these critical regions. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, sure, instead of M and R per. Yeah, so I guess it's what makes the equations nicest. Um, but like, in order to just get a, if you have a problem, to get like this XOR Gaussian problem, for instance, what we started with is okay, we need to know the correlation vectors, and then you try and close these, you try and get what's the minimal family that's gonna close the drift. Maybe there's different minimal families, but that's at least like how you'll get a valid set of finitely many summary statistics for which you can then start to do some analysis of like the dynamical systems you get. So that, that's the point. If I don't do any rescaling, then I'll just be stuck here. So of course, I can't probe this log d time. So what I do instead is I blow up space. And if I blow up space by root n, then I'm actually moving. Uh, so I'm moving an order 1 over root n in order 1 time. And then what's happening is you're doubling in order 1 time. So it's like the first scale is order root 1 over root n. The next one is like 2 over root n. Then on the next time scale, it's 4 over root n. And that's what leads to this log d. And so you can probe the log d by doing a set of these rescalings and then stitching them together. And you can actually get the log d escape from the saddle by doing this kind of stitching. <laughs> 